I'm uh, Chuck Reif. I'm the co-leader of the Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team. This team has been in existence for almost uh, eight years, or going on nine years now, and we've uh, basically uh, put together uh, some of the things that, that we, some of the larger projects that have gone on throughout uh, with grid methodology and, and grid editing throughout Central Region for the past uh, six, six to eight years. Um, Prior to my, my leadership and co-leadership of this team, John Gagan was leader, so a lot of the credit for whatever we've uh, accomplished or what, what we've brought about uh, goes to him as well. Um, additionally, on this call, we'll have uh, Andy Just, who's a, a, been a member of the team and a, a key developer of a lot of the technical and a lot of the GFE tools and procedures for, for, that we've put together over these past few years. And uh, he'll be on the call as well. And so will uh, Jerry Woodenfeld, who's the ITO over at uh, Milwaukee, who's been very helpful in getting all the uh, the blends that we've been doing and all the verification and all the, the excellent uh, background um, and the real technical uh, stuff together so that we can uh, basically come up with this this process that we're going to present to you today. Uh, essentially this uh, presentation is going to be about the forecast builder but it's a little more than that. It's really what we're after is a standard grid methodology for the entire region. Um, as noted in this intro slide, this has the, the, what we're presenting to you and what we're um, going to be test bedding this fall and into the, the, the spring has been approved by the Central Region uh, Region Label, Labor Council. Okay, a little background. Uh, basically, since the deployment of GFE, forecasters, as many of you all know, were never given a structured approach to how to develop a gridded forecast. We are kind of on our own out in the wilderness, and it was wild, wild west out there. Everybody coming up with their own techniques and then tricks to uh, come up with a forecast that the best they saw fit within GFE. So as a result, uh, forecasters had developed many different methods to produce this forecast. And some of these methods were efficient, but others were not. Uh, some were scientifically sound, but there are some others out there that are not. And the net result has been lost time uh, certainly times of frustration and persistent inconsistencies. If we're all trying to have the same forecast and the same forecast the same type of weather and not quite on the same page, uh, a lot of that results from the different methodologies we've been using to come up with our forecast. Um, it's hard enough to get forecasters to come up with the same idea of what's going to happen, but then to, to have them on the same page mentally but not able to display that properly um, amongst themselves within GFE can, can be a challenge. And we can see the results of that on the right here. We've got some uh, consistency stats throughout the, uh, the snow amount for the past 10 years and ice accumulation for the past five years. And um, yeah, definitely ice accumulation is, is a big, big trouble there. And snow amount has also uh, got some, some big issues. And these are two very high impact grids. These are, are some key IDSS grids that our, our partners really need a solid and confident forecast out of us. And we also need um, them to be relatively seamless with the neighbors because they're comparing the, the forecast right across the border. And if they don't line up, that lowers their confidence in both of the forecasts. So the uh, Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team, which is composed of 80% NWSEO members and has been composed of that ratio pretty much since the start. We have had a few of our members uh, move on into um, positions of management. We've had some members uh, given all they could and decided to take a break. We've had other people join and we pretty much kept up that ratio of being almost entirely uh, NWSEO members aside from the few uh, the Sioux advisors and the Sioux uh, folks that are on the team. So it was developed in 2008 and basically the goal was to promote and develop techniques that are efficient, improve consistency, and improve accuracy. And essentially, we believe we have done that during the, the past few years with the days four through seven policy. And also, the, uh, the current QPF experiment that we're under, and we've demonstrated that both of these, the policy and the experiment, have saved time, improved consistency, and improved accuracy. However, we still have a long ways to go, particularly with critical elements such as the snow and ice accumulation, as we saw in those previous slides. This is all happening in an environment where 
Uh, time on shift has become increasingly scarce as IVSS activities increase. And many factors are in play right now, uh, particularly the Weather Ready Nation Roadmap, the NAPU report, the OWA and the fully integrated field structure, and also the advent of the national blend of models. Um, I've taken this right from the OWA briefing, and uh, this is essentially uh, where they see the, the future of forecasting going, the future of how forecasters and, and WFOs will be spending their time. Um, currently, we're spending a lot of time in grid forecast production based on their analysis, and the, the Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team is pretty much in line with this. We see the, the same thing um, during our surveys and our, our uh, background uh, collection of information of how the offices and WFOs are dealing with grids and, and coming up with their forecast. The future, they see a lot less time uh, needed or available for grid forecast production. Um, so therefore, we need to come up with ways to streamline this as possible. The benefit of it, though, is that it will allow for a lot more time for IDSS um, activities as, as well as situational awareness and um, also for more science and training. The goal is for uh, the forecasters to be in the grids just for short-term forecast um, purposes and for the most part, but also dealing with areas of highest impact that which could be all the way out through seven days. So whereas the, the general feeling from this team and apparently from the OWA is that the biggest bang we get from the forecasters is to have them um, really focused on those near-term grids and really meshing where the observation of what's going on matches up with the forecast, those uh, next few hours into the next uh, 18 to 24 hours. Additionally, though, we all know that the models aren't perfect and therefore further out in the forecast all the way out through seven days, there are times when the forecasters might have to step in and make adjustments to make sure that we are presenting the, prop, the forecast that we want to have out there. So what we're presenting today is a way to have forecasters still in control of every period of the forecast, still overseeing the, the grids that are being sent out by the office and still being the driver of the forecast. Uh, continuing from the OWA briefing, their idea, and, and same with this team, is that a uh, common starting point is the best way to achieve a, a seamless forecast and a, a way to have everybody on the same page to begin with um, is the best way to maintain that throughout the forecast process. And eventually their goal is to have it take place via the national blend of models and the national water model. However, those aren't ready for us quite yet. So we have been using in Central Region, as you all know, we've been using the, the super blend for days four through seven and using that as our common starting point. Uh, the idea here now is going to be continue using the super blend and just extend the starting point of that down to period two and run that all the way through uh, the period 14, day seven. So that's basically what we're proposing is something truly evolutionary is to get us all working together both regionally and nationally to produce a gridded forecasting approach that is structured, systematic, and scientifically grounded. We want this to be replicable from office to office, forecaster to forecaster. Um, also, uh, as seen on that first slide, uh, we want to make sure we create snow amount, ice accumulation, and weather grids all in the same way to have a better chance of those lining up and being as seamless as possible and increasing the, the confidence that, uh, that our end users have in our forecast. And additionally, uh, for Central Region, we are intending to fill the policy gap that exists currently between the ESTF periods and the days four through seven uh, extended forecast practice. Um, these, this process that we've come up with has been developed and tested by field forecasters, those on the front lines, uh, those as part of the team, and then people um, that, in forecasters' offices that have tested it out for the team as well. It's intended to be a robust and flexible procedure with the support of regional developers responsive to the field. Ideally, this approach would become the national delivery mechanism for the MBM while maintaining the WFO forecaster as the driver of the official NWS forecast and its message. So to wrap it all up, what we've come up with and what we've developed over the past year, year and a half is the forecast builder procedure. 
This is a new GFE procedure which employs a streamlined and systematic methodology for developing the forecast. It provides a strong initialization scheme based on well-verifying blended models and also results in a consistent common starting point. This incorporates the observation similar to the ESTF data load and blend procedure. It can be cron-based and provide the initialization just like the C a current CR extended forecast initialization we use. It does employ the sound science to derive snow amount, ice accumulation, and weather grids using the, the techniques of the probability of weather type methodology to ensure internal consistency. And we believe ease in developing the weather grid similar to the way con consensus weather works except the forecaster will have a lot more control over what goes into that weather grid. Um, it, there are The way it works is it broke, breaks the weather grid down into various components. So you edit the component that you're interested in and then recombine them into the weather grid. It makes for a much easier updating process for the weather grid or adjustments to the weather grid, particularly in changing weather situations. And the goal of this team is to have all CR offices using the full version of this forecast builder procedure and this methodology by September 1st, 2017. That will be pending another CR RLC agreement, though, based on the results of our test bed and the result of uh, the experience over the next uh, year uh, working in, in, on this project. This was all developed in collaboration with the Upper Mississippi Valley Sioux community. We have members on the National Smart Inet team, so they are, we are making sure that whatever we're doing is in line with their future plans as well. And there's a, a real nice uh, sharing of science going back and forth between our teams to make sure that we're all on the same page and we have the same idea of where we're going, the same uh, roadmap essentially. Also, the NBM uh, Weather Grid team, we have members on uh, this team on that as well, so we're collaborating with them. Uh, CR consistency team has been an advisory uh, portion for this team as well. Um, we give uh, feedback to them, they provide us feedback, and we've been working in, in conjunction to uh, develop this and um, roll out the, this, these presentations and this whole project. Also, the, the WCO being the, the team is mostly composed of WCO members, and also uh, the uh, Central Region uh, Chair has is, is, uh, been briefed and, and, and fully uh, fully aware of what's going on and has uh, negotiated the, the outcome of what we are trying to present and do uh, for this project over the next uh, next year. In addition, Central Region Headquarters Management is also on board with this idea. Um, just a little brief uh, background on the CR uh, GMAP projects. Um, we formed in around 2008. Um, during that first year or two, we uh, spent a lot of time just surveying the field, seeing what was out there, seeing what, what techniques were, were being used to develop the, the grid forecasting, um, using those surveys and using the results of uh, data collection to see uh, what kind of tools were being used and how uh, widely distributed and how disparate some of the, the, the tools being used and methodologies were. Based on that and also based on the advent of uh, blending models and the benefit and the real uh, uh, key verification just demonstrated by the uh, blended models um, and uh, evidence via Boise Verify, we were able to roll out and develop the day four through seven policy, um, which also which really uh, beefed up the use of the model blends and uh, the use of gridded verification throughout the region. After that, we tackled the, the near-term grids and the, the trying to, to get our grids to be very useful to our partners when it comes to DSS updates. And that was, that was accomplished by higher resolution grid um, editing and higher details in those grids via the ESTF policy, as well as more frequent updates to those near-term grids. And lately, we've been working on the, the UPF WPC experiment, um, and this is getting us closer to the goal of one National Weather so Service forecast. And we've been doing that for the past uh, past year as well, and, and uh, just seeing how that experiment has been going. Essentially, we see this as all leading to a final culmination of what this team has been after, and that is coming up with a standard GFE methodology. And via the, the forecast builder is the way we see that occurring. Um, the idea is to use this as our period 2 through 14 policy and to make sure that we get all the benefits of having a, a common, high quality, common starting point and also a very uh, a similar methodology for working through those grids and um, 
coming up with a, a similar uh, training package for the one methodology that we think is the most effective way to approach the grids. We see the forecast builder as starting with the best verifying model data, also quality controlled observations, and then via collaboration locally, regionally, and nationally, combined with sound science, including top-down methodologies, the FRAM ice accumulation uh, technique for coming up with uh, both radial and, and flat line ice, and also the, uh, the, the science that was involved in the POWT, the probability of, of weather type. Combining all that into one forecast builder procedure will result in, in one national weather service forecast that, that is reliable and that has high confidence uh, of our end users because it's in line with the neighbors and they're, they're not seeing something from one page, one web page to a different web page just across the border. We do see immediate benefits for forecasters from this methodology, allowing forecasters to spend more time on uh, IBSS, especially those high impact situations, no, no matter where they occur within the, the seven day forecast. Uh, greater situational awareness and meteorological analysis. And this is a, an interesting uh, quote I heard, I believe was attributed to Louis, was that you cannot centralize situational awareness. So based on that, I, he believes that you can't centralize situational awareness, obviously. And that is a uh, a key benefit to using this process is to have more time to, to maintain and to enhance your situational awareness when dealing with uh, uh, incoming weather. Also dealing with the forecast problem or problems of the day. And also this will streamline the training and professional development of the forecasters toward this methodology, but in addition allow training and professional development in areas of uh, advancing areas of the science. We look for uh, the improved grid consistency by starting from a consistent and seamless database. And our main goal is to make sure that forecasters remain in control of the grids, i.e. they are over the loop, the forecast loop, and they also are in control of the message that those grids convey. Remain the key, key decision makers for a, a national to local collaborative process. Now we do acknowledge that there will be some upfront training time needed because uh, this is a whole new process for, for a good portion of the, 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 the central region. But we look to it as uh, the benefit being for future training will be focused and streamlined toward this methodology. In addition, any advancements that come along will be incorporated into this methodology. So this will be a methodology that grows. It also will automatically ensure that the meteorological forecast integrity of the database. And this will be an approach that allows forecasters to share experience, science, and techniques out to all the other offices. So if you have one good idea pop, pops up on one, one WFO, uh, that can be submitted to the team. We can review it and add that into the process and, and uh, share that out as quick as possible to the rest of the region and hopefully eventually to the rest of the weather service in general. And through this process, it will allow for improvements to instantly spread to all the offices. And for the grids, we see it being much easier now to back up another office. And also, if you move to another office, um, when going to that, you won't have to learn their technique so much as, as you have the, the basic techniques already uh, in practice. Uh, this is a graphic representing the, the, the forecast build evolution as we see it. We see that the, the GMAT supported developer or developers uh, taking input from the smart and improvements that could be out there. Any, any way we can make those smart it's better result in a better blend and a better um, starting point for our forecast. Also, we'll take uh, any ideas that come out of the Sioux community and the verification task force, look into ways that we can, can tweak the system, tweak, tweak the, the methodology to come up with uh, uh, better ways of verifying and better ways of getting more science into the process. And additionally, we'll also look for user feedback, and that will be from the forecasters and the, the SUs and the WFOs all using the, the, the process, but also from uh, feedback outside of the, uh, the region. So we might get feedback from offices trying it out in other regions or the uh, national uh, centers if, if we get feedback from them of how we can work better in a coordination with each other. So essentially, the forecast builder methodology is designed to evolve and improve with new techniques and scientific findings. 
Uh, the developers will be responsive to all feedback and suggestions. And this will be maintained by the, the GMAP, but also and become a means of science sharing, and that will result in a standard GFE methodology that will grow as the science grows. Um, looking for our implementation timeline, uh, starting August 1st, this, this, this next month, the, the CR extended forecast init procedure will be replaced by the forecast builder cron. Uh, for offices that aren't currently using the init procedure as a cron, this will be a bit of a change. The, the, the forecast will now cron at the same times that you are expected to run that, that the init procedure, the extended init. It's, it will now run at the same times in, in the background, give you a little warning to say that it's going to run, and then it will go ahead and, and save off the grids so that you can immediately compare those with your neighbors and uh, know that, you're, uh, that you guys have a pretty decent common starting point. This really is not that big a change. It's going to be mostly in the background, particularly for people that already have the CR forecast and it croned. They will really notice no change from this. The big change day will become on October 4th of 2016. We made October 4th rather than the 1st, since that, the 1st, I believe, fell on a Saturday. The 4th is a Tuesday, which allows for a, a day of an extra testing on Monday before that to make sure that we're ready to go. And also we'll have a pretty full complement of support from the, the GMAT and the ITOs uh, across, the, across the region. On that day, um, that is when we expect period two through day seven to be initialized at 530Z and 1730Z with the super blend um, via the forecast builder cron. And this will be for temperature, max T, min T, TD, wind, sky, and pops. Additionally, uh, wind gust QPF, snow ratio, max T loft, prob refree sleet snow mount ice accumulation. Some of those will be populated uh, through day three. Others will be set up to be ready to go as you work through the forecast builder process. You'll be coming up with your own snow mount ice accumulation and weather grids. And we also expect all offices to modify and collaborate the snow ratio grid. One of the main goals here is not to be editing the snow amount grid rather than rather to be using the, the com combination of a snow ratio grid and the QPF to determine uh, how your snow accumulation grids come out. And by doing that, this allows for the, the offices and the, the, the collaboration process to focus on just those two foundational grids, the, the QPF and then the snow ratio. You get those two lined up with each other, just like we do with temperature and dew point resulting in the RH and the apparent T. Um, that's how we would like to see the snow amount and ice accumulation grids come out. So what we are asking is that all offices on October 4th, 2016 start using Forecast Builder to produce their snow amount and ice accumulation grids. And this will also incorporate the, the, the FRAM model developed by Central Region Forecasters out at Topeka um, for ice accumulation. And this FRAM model has also been presented in the uh, weather and forecasting, uh, the, the, the August issue of Weather and Forecasting as a published paper. Now test bed offices, which we've nearly determined and we believe it's going to run from where, somewhere from the central plains up into the Great Lakes. It's going to be one giant cluster of offices so we can really get a better feel for how the consistent starting point and that this process will maintain a, a seamless uh, forecast uh, and an endpoint forecast that is, is more clearly evident when it, all the, the offices, um, 10 or 11 in total, are uh, working together in, in concert to use the full version of the forecast builder. Um, while other offices will have a choice between the full and light versions of the forecast builder. We do, again, expect and hope to uh, be able to have the forecast built on use for the entire region um, on September 1st, 2017, and this will include using it for ESTF updates and also incorporating the aviation and fire weather grids. Again, this will be pending a new RLC agreement based on our exper experiences using, through the test beds and, and what we're trying to um, have all the offices uh, do over the next uh, year. Okay, so let me go into the full forecast builder methodology. The way it breaks down is there are what we call foundation grids. These are the temperature, uh, dew points, wind, sky, pop, QPF, and snow ratios. And those are all designed to come right out of 
the, uh, the, the common starting point, that in this case, the super blend, maybe in the future, natural blended models. We also want the max teal off and the prob refreeze sleep to be initialized off model data as well. Those are, are considered, those, are, those last two are part of the top-down grid process. Other parts of the top-down grids include prob ice present and row temperature. Uh, most cases you'll have to probably edit those yourself, but those are our key components to coming up with a good uh, weather grid and snow amount ice accumulation grid based on that top-down process. We see uh, all edits taking place in the, these yellow initialized grids. These are where you'll be doing your editing of the grids. These are where you're collaborating. These are where you're, you're working together in concert with your neighbors and national centers to, to determine any adjustments you want to make to the grids throughout the entire suite of the forecast, all seven days. Once you make those adjustments, and we expect that to probably take the bulk of your time, uh, maybe a half hour on an on a easy day, maybe up to an hour and a half on, on a tougher day. But those all are adjusted and, and, and uh, worked on and, and, and basically signed off on by the forecasters uh, as they work through them. And once that happens, you move on to the next step, and that will allow the creation of precipitation types, accumulation grids, which is the snow and ice accumulation grids, and integrity checks. Make sure it checks the integrity, make sure nothing's violating the integrity before it moves on to create the accumulation types. And this, these, this process is all completely derived. We're not looking for any editing. If there's edits needed, we want people to go back and either adjust the temperatures or adjust the pop or QPF or snow ratio to come up with what they, the outcome they want from their accumulation grids and their precip type of grids. Um, the next step, this is the full methodology, will be to come up with the non-precipitation types, and this is most uh, important for the uh, weather grid. So based on that, the non-precipitation -pre types include fog, frost, uh, thunders in this as well, and um, in addition, uh, spray for those places that see that, and also blowing snow, and even smoke if you're in that kind of situation as well. But So this is the, the step where you would create those, those, those grids that will help develop the uh, weather grid. So finally, the weather grid is derived and completely derived, no editing of the weather grid, uh, from the steps that you've done before, the non-precipitation types and also those foundation grids and the adjustments that you made in collaboration with your neighbors. Now the light version of the, the forecast builder, what I just showed you is what the test beds, we would like the test beds to operate under. The light version is, is what we want at least uh, the rest of the, the region to operate under. Um, basically, it slims down the, the full version of Forecast Builder by skipping the top-down steps. We're not going to require uh, using the top-down steps. Uh, it does update the max teal off and prob refreeze uh, sleep um, grids in the background to help catch uh, mis mixed precipitation events. It also skips the steps of non-precipitation precipitating types and updating the weather grids. So this is where we would um, allow or expect you guys to use the your local weather grid editing process to update the weather grid. By doing that, though, we acknowledge that this will not ensure the integrity of the weather grids. Depending on how you, you come up with your uh, weather grids at your local office, we cannot guarantee that it will be have integrity. Um, using the, the full version and running through the forecast builder process is designed to make sure that the entire database is completely uh, has complete integrity. There, there's no violation of any rules you're not. Um, looking at places where you'll see uh, um, fog, where you've got an RH down to 50% or something like that. It, it, running through the process will take care of the, those kind of inconsistencies. You're not going to have snow accumulation at 45 degrees or stuff like that. But, um, or even the, the, the snow in the weather grid at that, that level. So the light forecast methodology starts with the foundational grids. Um, and has the, the initialized top-down grids in the background there. And again, those are all initialized. This is all where you'd be doing your edits, and this is where you'd be doing most of your time collaborating and making sure that you're, you're maintain a, as seamless as possible um, boundary with your neighbors on these elements. And this is a, your opportunity to make any adjustments that you need based on uh, how the, the model is doing or how the, the trends might be doing as well. Again, the precipitation type, uh, accumulation grids, and integrity chips are all done automatically, all derived, no editing for those. But at this point, we're, we're, we're having the forecasters who use the light methodology come up with their own weather grid, essentially. Um, they will be 
coming up with their own ways of producing the weather grid and doing it the way they've been doing um, uh, since, since since before this, this started. And the, the hope is that some will try out the full methodology and, and hopefully realize that it's a, a pretty efficient process and, and pretty pretty handy to have and the ability to be able to quickly adjust one component of the weather grid and not have to redo the whole thing. But for offices that pr prefer just sticking with their own weather methodology for now, we're, we're uh, having that as, as an option via the, the light forecast builder. Okay, um, we as a team um, pledge to offer the following training and support. Um, we, 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 the whole process employs the most current peer-reviewed scientific techniques via the, using the snow ratio, using the FRAM ice accumulation model, which is uh, done by Chris Sanders and Brian Bargerbuck at Topeka, um, also the top-down approach for forecasting precipitation type, and we are plan to have operational deployment videos on how to use the forecast builder, ways to improve upon the consensus initialization, and winter weather training we look for via uh, some job sheets, a West 2 GFE simulation when GFE becomes available on the West 2. At, that, at this point it's unknown when that's going to happen, so we are also looking into various uh, tricks that we might be able to do in practice mode that could help uh, uh, simulate some of uh, what we're trying to do for a, a, a messier type weather situation. We also have uh, real-time support 24-7. The, the GMAT room is always available in the uh, NWS chat um, and usually there's somebody from the team because we're a lot of us are shift workers um, available to, to help out. We also will have a VLAB uh, page that's up there and it, it's um, available to uh, have all the information there and also it's going to have a forum and a uh, area where you can ask questions and a frequently asked questions section as well in addition to documentation and training links. Um, the GMAT chat room I mentioned and also we believe that the Central Regional Rock will be available um, for uh, collaboration assistance. I don't know if that's been finalized but that's something that uh, we look to as a team to uh, see if that we can get that uh, uh, working as well. So. Now I think I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Andy Just. Um, he's going to go through a, for, a quick forecast builder demonstration, and he's going to start with the forecast, the full version as shown. All right, thanks, Chuck. When I see the presenter roll here, I'll grab it and, and. Okay. There you are. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Chuck. Um, so yeah, I'll go through a quick demo here of the forecast builder and how this works. Um, the first step is really uh, pretty simple here. You just choose a time period you're interested in. You know, the, the default that it's set as right now is just day four to day seven because that's what the policy is going to be for you know running uh, August first. Um, right now, again, it's run on it's run on the cron starting August first, but you know you could rerun the procedure as shown here. Um, a few other options on here, the place to start at, uh, let's say, for example, you were happy with the what you had in the foundation grids, but you needed to go in and make a tweak to the top down because you noticed based on some TAMDAR data or upper air data of some, some, some sort that some of the top down grids needed an, an, an adjustment. So you can go and jump, jump in with that and skip a step. Uh, so I just want to alert you to that. And then there's some, a couple optional items on there for aviation and fire weather grids. Again, those are something we're kind of thinking ahead to uh, for next year. Built that in. So basically those options will run your procedure after um, the weather the weather grid portion of Forecast Builder is, run, is done with. The second step, and again, this is the most important, I would say, of the entire Forecast Builder process is the foundation grids. On this, uh, in this GUI, you have uh, various foundation grid elements and that you can initialize those and you'll see in the GUI too what's going to be used to initialize those grids. So currently it's super blend is the, I'll call it the main model uh, and then you can overwrite those with short, with short blend and con short when those are available and this will do that automatically and then in the observations if, if they overlap the time period you chose. So those data sets right now are considered the best verifying data sets over the long term. And again, you get that opportunity to blend in with observations. 
And as I stated, it's most important. You should spend pretty much about 90 to 95 percent of your time on this step because this is going to everything from here is going to translate downstream to how does your snow and ice look? How does your weather grid look? Uh, maybe how do some of the non-precipitation type elements uh, um, appear? You know, those. You know, based on that full forecast methodology flow chart you saw earlier, uh, you can kind of see there's dependencies ahead. So again, spend your time here, get these edited, collaborated, whatever you need to do to get those uh, complete. And really, your objective is to go through and seek targets of opportunity for modification in a collaborative manner. Maybe there's issues with the models with the snowpack out there. Or maybe there's issues with, you know, they're not mix in deep enough for purposes of dew points uh, and you're in a fire weather situation. Some quick examples where maybe the consensus database may have problems. Again, training will be provided on that uh, as, as uh, we go on through the next couple months. Well, here's what it looks like, uh, you know, where I've chosen a time period for um, just a couple 12-hour uh, couple segments here. You know, just at this point, you can save and share those grids immediately, collaborate them and make any adjustments. Uh, and again, as I said, this brings in um, data sets like Conshore, Short Blend, and Super Blend, so uh, you get all those good stuff to start with. In the future, uh, again, as we anticipate this to hopefully be an NVM delivery vehicle, we can just swap out, say, Super Blend with NVM, and uh, there'd be no big change for us, say, for purposes here in Central Region. The next step is the top top down section. This section is only needed for specific situations. Freeze and rain, fleet, and a situation maybe with rain where you've got a deep cold isothermal layer. An example here I've given you is maybe you're sitting just above one Celsius all the way up to two two thousand feet. Um, note that if you run this for forecast builder in the t over the time period that you're looking at and your hourly temperatures are all above 40, uh, 40 Fahrenheit across your domain. Um, so, you know, only pretty much summer months this is going to trigger uh, that, that you'll be able to completely skip this step. The models that are incorporated here um, include the NAM, GFS, and RAP because right now those are the best, uh, best vertical resolution data that we have in AWEPS. If, you know, as time goes on, if we get more models with better vertical resolution, the Canadian is a good example that, you know, has potential that we could get more vertical resolution in, those would get in incorporated as well. And there is a reference here for top-down training, and it's right here in the presentation. So here's a quick example of what that looks like. If you haven't done anything with the top-down grids uh, before, your uh, max teal loft, it's just a quick Quick proxy of that of that warm nose that um, in determine precipitation type. Uh, you know, you, it should vary across your CBA. They map to a specific key type, so it's nice. You can change one. You can change four precipitation types all at the same time with one grid. Pretty lot simpler. Uh, this is a step you'll collaborate with. You know, with your neighbors. And again, the model data is usually a decent starting point, and then just take a look at you know upper air data, satellite. Uh, TAM as we mentioned earlier, to help adjust. And again, again currently only the, the NAM, GFS, and RAP are considered for the top-down blends. So again, after those are done, pretty much the next couple steps are all derived. Uh, first is, you know, the precipitation type, snow, ice, and integrity checks. There's the, the GUI pops up, you know, things for a stratiform shower, rain, drizzle. I would just say at this step, Keep things simple. Keep it simple for the public. Just go with, you know, if you have showers and stratiform going across your domain, just, just pick one type. Uh, same thing with the rain drizzle. I mean, you have that option of both, but the simpler you keep it, you know, I think it makes it just easier for the public to, to understand. Uh, we also have in this GUI temperature thresholds for snow, uh, for all snow and all liquid. Those generally work pretty well. Um, you know, if you have to change those, Make sure to coordinate them because, again, those are the defaults, but you may have a specific situation where those temperatures may not uh, work out. So you wanna, we want to have the ability to, for you as a forecaster to be able to adjust. And this is going to use background science and statistics to generate those pro 
probabilities of precipitation types and snow on ice to cube grids. If you don't like the output, um, let's just say you were you were expecting to see like you know six inches of snow and you only end up with three. Um, go back and adjust you know maybe the foundation or top down grid top down grid. So for example, if you have like a uh, a four cell, I'm going to say a four Celsius max T loft, um, which would correspond to more of a liquid situation. That would explain why your snow, um, your snow was reduced in half. Uh, remember again here that this is the one NWS forecast. So, you know, again, collaboratively change either foundation or top down. And again, at this step. Going into this step, the uh, integrity checks are also performed to help update things like apparent temperature, dew point, RH. So let's take a look at an example here. Again, this is just fictitious that I <laughs> generated in practice mode. Uh, the results should be relatively seamless. I mean, if you have a seamless foundation and seamless top down, this is going to be seamless just because we're all running the same process. And that's pretty much the only way to get snow and ice the same is to have everybody running the same uh, same process for them. Uh, note that you'll also see on here that you've got these grids of ice line acume and ice flat acume. Those are produced out of the FRAM model uh, and they can be used for additional uh, DSS because now you'll be able to see what potential ice accumulations you would see on say a power line or trees versus that of what would occur on roads that would come out of the flat ice. And that's a great step forward for the, both the region and the NWS as a whole. Uh, a shout out goes to you know the develop and the developers of the of the frame those that did the research behind it. Also seen on here is the uh, those probably precip type grids for rain showers, freezing rain, and that. Feel free to look at those. Um, those I think are going to be good for perhaps additional DSS for some of your core and deep core partners. Uh, you know, those that, you know, maybe say like a depart Department of Transportation or somebody like that that, need, that may need to know what kind of uh, treatment that they would need to put down, that would give uh, some help for that. All right, we're almost done here. Now we're going to take a look at non-precipitation types. Provided within Forecast Builder is a couple of tools to help you populate some of the uh, non-precip elements like fog, frost, thunder here. Uh, you know, so there's a, for example, for the blown snow, there's a, a, a science-based research study in, in, incorporated there. Uh, it's a little, uh, I know there's a couple, another study that's done out of two out of um, Grand, For Grand Forks and uh, with some great, great stuff there. That's not incorporated quite yet. Um, you know, there'll be, there's, I think in general, all of these non-precipitation elements need um, more, imp more improvement. And they're, they're expected over time, and I think this is something that could be great coming out of this, out of forecast, out of forecast builder, the test beds, et cetera, to help bring, bring more tools out to help uh, you know, do some of these, uh, do some of these elements. And you know, one, I mean, in this infrastructure, it's really easy to do it because you're just dealing with scalar, uh, scalar grids. So, for example, here's something simple for. For thunder, if you're kind of thinking that maybe you know you're in a kind of a showery situation with plenty of instability, say let's take the summer months where you could just take your pop and put it into your thunder, and just say yeah, you have that um, you have that available for you in that one tool that if you click it, run it over the over your time range, boom, you've got it there. All the thunder's populated. And then last step is to do that weather. Um, you've got a bunch of options on here if you want to uh, adjust it, but 95% or more of the time you'll be just running with these defaults. Um, nice, things, nice thing is it's going to bring in those convective watches to enhance the weather grids. Um, so if you get SBC comes out with a tour watch, uh, you know, rerun this step of forecast builder for the weather grids and you can quick, quickly get the, the tour. You know, Whatever attributes you want, your T is going to be raised to T plus. That all happens automatically. Weather intensities aren't. It's nice. They're all derived from QPF snow amounts. So, you know, from both forecaster, forecaster, and office to office, we all now will have the same 
intensity going, and at least how we compute it across. That's something that you know hasn't existed. And again, with all these options, you do have some flexibility in how that weather grid is um, weather grid is created. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, here we've got it, it, it's messy, and expect that, uh, especially in complex weather. It's it's more of a function of how the weather grid is designed. Um, we have various type, you know, various intensities and probabilistic coverages and weather types and um, optional attributes. All these, though, if any of these things vary, that grid is going to be messy. But uh, NDFD for matters of point and click will handle the messy output. Everybody has as part of the ESTF tool install way back a couple years ago overrides for the central region ZFP, so that, that will handle your, your ZFP formatter to simplify the output. Uh, the weather grid is being looked at to, in uh, ways to simplify it because it, it's kind of something we've almost done to our own selves to make this messy that we could really, there are ways that we could probably make this a lot better. Uh, and even though it may be messy, I wouldn't worry about it because if your foundation and top-down grids are collaborated well, the precip types and weather will also be uh, will also be seamless. The same the same way all the way down all the way down through the process. Mm -hmm. So um, you know everything starts again that first step, especially that first step. Things like temperature and dew point get those things right because everything like this is going to change based on that information. So to conclude here. Uh, Feedback is strongly recommended. What I've shown as the full forecast build in terms of demonstration over the course of a, say, the test bed period, that may change um, as we get into, say, what we might be looking at for next September. Again, everything's open, open to changes. And, and remember, this, the, the, the feedback that you provide, positive, negative, ideas for improvement, et cetera, will shape the forecast the future for this as potential national delivery mechanism for NBM. Uh, it's great. We're going to, we're, we in Central Region are going to be way, you know, kind of way ahead in, in that thinking. Uh, we've got, again, a couple of sites set up here uh, or contact of way, or ways to provide feedback and con contact us. You've got, again, the Forecaster Builder Virtual Lab, which is provided the address there. Uh, the email address is open. Uh, we just tested that out yesterday. Um, that's running now. Uh, we got a feedback form. We are anticipating test beds to fill that out um, probably once the ship, is, or, as, or at least especially during high impact situations uh, where that information would be great, very helpful. There's also a link on here for full documentation. The one last thing I want to mention um, before I forget is uh, is uh, there's a tech order out and uh, to help with that uh, August 1st implementation date for the replacement of the CR extended with the forecast builder uh, cron so if you can get that done as soon as possible apologize for the short short time uh, short time frame but again try and get that done as soon as possible with that uh, I'll transfer it back to Chuck um, or, and uh, for any questions. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, before we do that, I just want to um, make sure everybody's clear that what you just walked through was the entire full version of the uh, the forecast builder. Um, that's what the test beds are going to be trying to are going to be doing, and that's what we're going to be uh, fully supporting them and, and working through and, and trying to come up with improvements to the process. Um, I will like to say that a lot of the the, the more a lot of the new stuff that people will be doing when they use the forecast builder is based on the POWT, which there already are about a third of the offices in Central Region using the POWT, and even a couple outside the region that are either investigating or using it. So um, we are well along, and that kind of gets to the point that as a region, we are far, far ahead of where any other regions are when it comes to being ready to move into the MBM uh, world and using um, our forecasters to their best abilities and best extent by uh, focusing mostly on uh, situational awareness and uh, getting the high detail, high resolution in weather information into the, the near-term grids. Um, the central regions really uh, stayed ahead of the curve on this um, through a lot of what um, 
what we've been uh, doing over these past eight years. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll notice that uh, other regions, especially if you have contact with other people in other regions, um, are simply uh, caught up in a, a whirlwind of uh, changes that, that they aren't really prepared for. And yet I feel our forecasters in this region are very familiar with the concept of using blended models, concept of a, a common starting point, and the concept of how we work together collaboratively to make changes to that forecast. So I, I think we are kind of uh, lucky to, to have been in this region um, being on the forefront of this. In addition, a lot of what we are have done and are doing um, is leading to changes and adjustments in the, the national plan. Um, this project, the forecast builder project, also has the opportunity to be a demonstration for uh, how the national blended model will work. So um, in a sense, we are testing the concept, proof of concept, for how forecasters can still be the primary driver of the forecast and yet start with a common starting point and have a, a collaborative and seamless uh, forecast throughout the process. So uh, I, I, I feel blessed to be in a, a central region, and, and I, I think uh, in the long term, our forecasters are much, bet, much better shaped to, to adjust to any changes that are coming via the, the advent of uh, new science and, and improved techniques. So uh, I think with that, we're probably ready to uh, go ahead and have some questions. Sure. Our first question comes from Bruce Smith. Uh, Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, we're just uh, curious to what extent this new technique will standardize grid temporal resolution. Okay, uh, Andy, do you want to talk to that, or shall I? Yeah, I can. I can talk to it. Uh, yeah, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, the question um, about standardizing temporal stuff. There will be uh, some some standardizing standardization to that um, because of the way that the cron um, cron is run. I mean, you have some configuration things like um, when, like I'm just going to say like like QPF snow and ice in the days four through seven. That's all. That's all um, a configurable option uh, because that's not in the NDFD um, officially um, as of now. Nor will this procedure do that. But you know. Um, Unless you basically tell tell it to do it, uh, I'd also like to invite maybe uh, uh, Jeff Jeff Craven to talk a little bit about this if he's um, if he's on to to, dis to discuss that about NDFD. I mean, but that, as far as this as far as Forecast Builder uh, does this, I mean, it, it's it's going to just do what the you know do the NDFD requirements and make sure everything's consistent for the purposes of producing you know snow, ice, and weather. I think as a team, we acknowledge that there are uh, there are some differences out there with how uh, offices are constructed, how they have their, their time constraints and their, uh, their their temporal resolution throughout their grids. Um, this does standardize some of that. Um, and in particular, we are going to uh, six hourly weather or six hourly um, pops in the extended portion. Uh, we're taking advantage of uh, the the higher resolution that had recently come about in the extended models and the, the mid-range mid models and allowing for a little more timing to be able to be displayed using the six-hour pop uh, scheme as well. Um, additionally, I, I, the, the, one of the be beautiful things about this procedure is it's very, it's highly configurable and, and, and Andy's done an awesome job putting it together in a way that offices can have it configured to their, their techniques that they like. Um, for particular, uh, in, in, one, one uh, example is uh, the, the mountain sites. They have a configuration that allows them to use uh, um, a wet ball temperature if they choose, or um, other sites that might use RH rather than um, dew points and derive the dew point from the RH or vice versa. There's a configuration option there that can take care of that. And um, for a particular uh, example, my office, we do hourly pops all the way through uh, seven days. And Andy's put a configuration there that allows for uh, the, the data to come in, the common starting uh, database to actually have hourly pops for us. And then the 12-hour the pops are what we uh, collaborate with. So the, 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 the beauty of, of the procedure that he's put together is uh, um, the ability to configure for local office options. Um, we also are cognizant of the MBM and the, the NDFD and how that data is going to be delivered and how the temporal uh, um, 
uh, breakdowns are, are occurring and how those are adjusting in the future as well. And, and our, our goal is to have the region ready to, to uh, populate the NDFD in a manner that it's going to be presented to the public, um, have that um, available from our forecast right natively into the, the, the NDFD and not have to be broken up or any, anything, any other tricks or techniques to get the higher resolution that NDFD might provide. So we'll, we'll probably stay on top of it and there probably will be additional training and additional adjustments made as the NDFD and uh, National Blended Models um, start making adjustments toward higher resolution as well. And just to uh, follow on uh, with that question about the uh, temporal resolution, um, there are efforts underway to get a national consensus between the regions for the national blended models and the NDFD grid lanes. So we'll let you know as soon as we uh, have something um, nailed down on that. Okay. Um, Matt Bunkers, I noticed you had your hand raised. Do you have a question? Yeah, this is Matt. I have uh, three questions. The first one, um, you mentioned backup would be made easier with this versus the current setup. I'm not sure how that's going to be because everybody still needs, to, you know, their bias corrected grids are part of the process, so we only have those available for our local office. So would you please explain how backup will be easier? Yeah, I can. I can address that, Matt. One of the things with backup, um, yeah, you are you are correct with bias corrected, but we are working on one additional improvement for the backup purpose of thinking in that realm. Um, that will come with the next with our next tech orders to get the uh, the adjusted databases, adjusted MAV, MET, MEX, um, and those ones all working in backup mode. So that will that will help even more. Um, but one of the problems that we have. Uh, when you go into backup mode, uh, is that you have to, you may have to use whatever the, their um, their procedure is, or whatever their methodology is to try and generate their grids or generate their snow and ice weather, etc. Well, with this everywhere, you, that won't be an issue anymore. Um, you'll have you'll be able to use the same thing from like say from office to office. You don't have to relearn a different technique for um, that may be completely off what you were expecting and so again it's a great way of sharing this technology and keep it up to date. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. The next thing is the integrity check. So let's say we go through the whole forecast builder process and after that maybe we adjust some maximum temperatures somewhere. Is there going to be a, a kind of a standardized new integrity check that maybe it might include pops as well and weather, but that you could just rerun that without having to do the whole forecast builder again. Yeah, right now it's it's part of that step that step three with the precept uh, precept types because I mean if you change things like max and min t, um, you know especially especially in winter time, uh, you'd want to rerun your types so you would just you know hit OK and just keep going keep going through the process. I mean to go fully from there to you know, keep pressing OK. It's going to take you maybe maybe a minute, a minute or less, depending upon again how much time period you looked at. But basically, you, you would want to rerun the forecast builder if you make some changes just to ensure all the integrity is uh, OK. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. At least. Yeah. At least you know, especially like I say, especially in winter time when you know that a you know say a change of temperature would probably will involve, you know, something that could happen with pre, with P type. Oh, not even with P type, but with weather itself. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then the third thing is I know you'll probably make a recorded version of this available, but would you also please provide the PDF because it looks like there's a lot of embedded links that we couldn't get from the recorded version. Right. Certainly uh, we can do that. Okay, uh, next, uh, Mike Fowl, uh, go ahead. Yeah, guys, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it was great. Um, had, a, I guess, two, a two-part question here. Um, for training purposes, obviously that's going to be a, a big focus of, of, of interest. Is there any hope of getting a case on the West uh, and getting GFE on the West? Do you have any update there? Or are there any plans, perhaps, to use something like the grid seller, where we can run some sort of a 
a pseudo simulation using the practice mode functionality. Um, without that, obviously, it makes training much more difficult. Thanks. Yeah, yeah Mike, uh, I, I, I attest to that with the, with the GFE I, in West. I really wish that was available. I really wish. Um, but I know that the West, the West group is very much focused on getting that up to 16, the kind of latest AWIPS build. Uh, so I, there's no idea about when GFE is going to be, um, GFE is available. Maybe they'll get it in this West you know, with the 16, but I, I don't know. Uh, and until that time, uh, yeah, we're, tr we're trying to think of some ideas on how to handle, on, han on how to handle this. Um, I had one which was, you know, take a practice, take our practice database so we could actually, st you know, store it and then go to like in a service backup mode as, as us and then just populate the AR ARX database as, a, as an idea. But, yeah, uh, very tricky. But, well, right now the idea would be is you'd run various things through, um, through a practice mode and, and create them as the instructions would provide in, a, in, a, in job sheets which are being composed at this time. But we could really we could inspect grid grid seller as an idea as well. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, yeah, like I said, I, I I know you guys are working hard on that, and uh, it, it would just for some of the stuff. Obviously, you can you can do it well enough, you know, with the kind of the transitional events. But when you when you're talking about a pure mix P type event, boy, it'd be nice to be able to to have some sort of a database where we can we can do that with. So. Uh, I'm willing to help. If there's any way I can, I can help Andy here in, uh, from Des Moines. Please let me know. Thanks. We'll do. It. Thanks, Mike. Okay, going back to Matt for a minute. Matt, did that answer your question, or did you want to follow on? I don't have any questions. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, uh, looks like uh, Lyle Barker has a question. Um, I will have to have him unmute his line by entering his PIN first. Lyle, do pound one, two, two, pound. Okay, Lyle, go ahead. Well, this, this is Chris Miller here, Lyle's in the room with me, but... Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> I have a question about the, um, the, the WPC Snowfall uh, that's supposed to be collaborated closely with them. Um, how does that fit into this process if the snow amount is automatically generated? Yeah. I guess that's where we uh, get a little more dicey with our interaction with WPC. We've had this great experiment going on with them and, and demonstrated that we can uh, at least be on the same page QPF-wise and therefore uh, pretty close on the same page snow amount wise The problem is, as you know, we're all running two procedures. We're running a procedure to populate the extended forecast, and then an hour later in some cases, especially here in the eastern time zone, we're running the QPF uh, uh, procedure and essentially we're redoing a, a part of the database and we wanted to really avoid that we want the forecasters to have one streamlined process kind of be done with the forecast and ideally be done ahead of time when they need IDSS products therefore we requested that the WPC try anything they can to get us preliminary uh, QPF information and, and as a result we, we ex I mean we'd also require them to have their snow amount uh, graphics line up completely with their QPF graphics. And I think they still have some issues with that. So uh, the goal is at least if they could get us just a little bit quicker with the, the preliminary QPF, at least we'd have the QPF going into it. We can um, use, the, uh, use the snow ratio and our collaboration to come up with the internal, uh, or come up with the, the, our snow uh, accumulation forecast. And I, I uh, we should be pretty close using that structure, but I, I don't want our forecaster to have to wait an extra hour to start their DSS process for a grid as critical as snow accumulation is um, until they are done with their uh, hand drawings. 
Okay. Did yeah, that help, Chris? That. Yeah, it did. Yeah, thank you. Well, and kind of a quick, just kind of a sort of follow up on that too. Then I assume then when the whole forecaster builder process is is done, um, then there's the matter of the hazard grids. I mean, the hazard grids are still going to be the way we've been doing them, or are they going? They're not going to fall out of forecaster builder, are they? No, hazard grids will still be, yeah, the way the forecasters have been doing them. Uh, that is an interesting idea, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that might interest you, uh, Andy, especially with your, your, your WSW formatter that uses mostly grid uh, stuff to co construct the WSWs. If anybody hasn't downloaded that or tried that out or put that formatter in to test it out, that's a really excellent way of having a standardized uh, WSW uh, development during these winter situations, and I highly recommend it. And uh, I think we should, probably should push this as part of our uh, of our, our experiment. So I, I think as we go along, we'll, we'll try to get that encourage at least the offices, especially the ones that are testing it, to uh, use the WSW uh, for hazard formatter. Okay, good. Thanks, guys. Okay, and we'll go to Zach Finch now. Zach. Yeah, this is Zach from Cheyenne. Um, I had a question in terms of like uh, kind of where the mountain offices um, uh, fit in here. Are we when when the goal is for all central region to go to this by I think October of next year? Does that include the uh, mountain offices too? That would be the right. goal. Um, yeah, we're 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 trying to work hard with with the mountain offices and um, we're, we're hoping to actually have a mountain office that is, is going to be willing to um, not officially be part of the test but at least try out the, the full forecast builder. I think uh, Jim Lee uh, as our central region uh, um, uh, steward is working on, on trying to put something together that, that could at least because we definitely need the feedback from the mountain offices. Um, and so we, 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 we definitely are interested in all the feedback we can get from the mountain offices using this process and Ideally, we would like to have all the whole region on by 2017, but we'll uh, we'll just have to see how that goes. Yeah, we're working hard. Yeah, we'd also like you know the the mountain offices too. I think have some good good techniques that I think will be uh, available or uh, will be applicable to elsewhere. Uh, obviously, our graphic stuff maybe more more mountain centric, um, but I mean there are various CWAs out east that are Great Lakes and even I used to have to deal with uh, upslope, et cetera. Uh, one of the things I know that I've, you know, I've kind of learned um, through email and various, you know, through the mountains, a lot of, uh, when it comes to things like top top down, um, that, uh, especially with Max, Max T Loft, it's the wet bulb that's, uh, you know, very, very important. So as stated in the actual proposal document that that Max that max T loft, the actual computation may change. May change, um, and we've done some local research here using looking at sound, and that does seem, indeed seem to be the case that the wet bulb is more um, more applicable, applicable as you get farther west. So those are things that are, you know, are kind of coming out. Okay. Um, yeah, I had uh, one more question too. I. I I do think you know we'll have uh, at least a few forecasters here that are willing to uh, test out the uh, at least the light version, uh, maybe even the full also. Um, but my second question is with regard to the light version. So, from what I understand, that will basically keep any mixed precip types out, um, other than just like a rain snow mix. It will keep uh, freezing rain and sleet out. You can you could still get freezing rain and sleet if um, based on what happens with the max T loft. I mean, there's going to be a check. It's going to look at both max T loft and surface temperature, and from that be able to decide whether it's a rain snow situation or whether it's a, a situation that might get uh, freezing rain. I think for your area, you might get it off to the um, to the east, but uh, that should that's most of the time. That's how. Uh, yeah, you'd end up with freezing rain or sleet because again, those light, in the light version, the max T loft and property freeze populate in the background. You won't you won't see it; it just happens. So you go from foundation grids to the precept types, and that happens all automatically in the background. 
Okay, so to basically, if you basically want to eliminate the possibility of any of that freezing rain, you'd have to go through the full version and not populate the max teal off grid. Is that correct? That'd be correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. All righty, well, uh, yeah, thank you. That's all I got. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, we aren't seeing any more uh, Chuck and Andy. Um, unless, would you have any uh, final comments you would like to make? I'll go ahead and uh, speak. I, I, I didn't want to get too political here, but I do want to address some of the uh, concerns that I think some of the forecasters have that this process, and certainly the ones that aren't in Central Region, um, don't understand the, what we've gone through in this region, how we've demonstrated, and how we've uh, really uh, come up with a pretty good uh, starting point for the days four through seven and the results of, of what that has done and how that has led us to the point where we think we're ready to go all the way to periods two through period 14 with the same process. Um, so there is concern, I, I understand, outside of the region in particular that we this is like a management uh, means of trying to take the forecast away from the forecasters, but that's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make sure that the forecaster always has a role in the grids all the way through day seven, and we want to be able to demonstrate that to the higher-ups, that if we have a large enough cluster of offices producing seamless forecasts seven days out, that there's no reason not to have, uh, have forecasters still entirely in control of the forecast and able to make the adjustments that we think that we need to be able to make. And so I, I really see this this proposal not as anything to undermine the forecasters, but the exact opposite. We are bolstering the forecasters to maintain a key component in the forecast process as far out as they want us to forecast. And from in my mind, that has to be at least seven days, and I wouldn't mind seeing go to 10 days if we end up forecasting that far out. But I think the forecasters need to remain a key component and have final say and oversight over the, the actual forecast. And this is a process that our team has envisioned to making sure that the forecaster are still entirely in the loop and over top of that loop. So I think this is our opportunity to, as a region, demonstrate that we can do it. We've already demonstrated as a region that we have the best consistency scores, we have the best verification scores. Now is the time to demonstrate to headquarters that this, this process and, and us working together to improve the process can do exactly what they've asked us to do and um, feel no need to replace any of the part of the forecast with a, a model directly. Okay. Um, oh, no, we do have... Um, go ahead. I'll, I'll just uh, I was going to say we have one more question. Said. Okay, one more question. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bruce Smith, go ahead. Yeah, just real quick, and it's as much a comment as anything, and, it, and I think it builds nicely onto, uh, into, onto Chuck's uh, comments there. Great presentation, guys. Great information. I think this is going to move us forward. But, you know, one, in my mind at least, one elephant in the room in all this is, uh, is, so, is uh, having each forecaster in each office ideally defining these targets of opportunity similarly. Uh, so it's not wide open, free for all once we start with a common uh, starting point. And, uh, I think it was mentioned early again by Chuck in the presentation that maybe the rock could help facilitate that process, and I know that's preliminary to say that, but we'll want to be thinking about ways to uh, to organize that process so offices and forecasters are looking at targets of opportunity similarly. Yeah, I agree, Bruce Smith. That's a that's exactly where we uh, see uh, some entity outside of the individual offices having a role in uh, helping to. Uh, figure out targets of opportunity. And uh, in addition to the, the ROC or some local uh, or regional thing, the national uh, centers also could, could play a part. Certainly uh, we see that with uh, the SPC, and we also see, and we've seen some of that with the winter weather experiment with the uh, WPC where, where they can be involved. It's just a matter of 
uh, making sure that involvement's not too intrusive, make sure it flows well with what we're working with as well, our process. So uh, that, that's going to be definitely uh, something that, that we work together, uh, both regionally and uh, uh, extra regionally, to make sure that um, we have a, a very smooth flowing process that allows for uh, uh, collaboration all up and down the line. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Okay, uh, Andrew, Jerry, do you guys want to uh, say anything before we conclude? No, I just, uh, as Andy still saying, thank you, uh, thank you, Chuck, thank you to, thank you to everybody for, you know, jumping on this presentation. Uh, again, uh, hopefully this can become again the national national delivery mechanism. We stay we stay in the lead here um, and give us. Give us feedback. We want to hear everything, and you come up with the ideas on how to improve. What, let's go. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> Make sure that everybody's aware that this is what the VLAB page currently looks like. Um, uh, Shane Searcy and, and, and working with John Ice has put together a really good page for us. We've got uh, information up there now. Uh, this presentation will be up there. The recorded version of it will be up there uh, as soon as we have that available. In addition, we have uh, just the, uh, the the slideshow is available on here as well, um, and we have a screenshot that, that will, you can go through at, at your leisure and see how the, the steps all uh, are, are laid out. Um, also, we have the, the, the forum and also a latest news area. We will have the FAQ will be populated soon. And uh, definitely this will be the place for uh, discussions and where we'll get some, some uh, feedback to any, any of the forecasters or anybody else that has any questions. Um, in addition, we also have the fork, uh, NWS Forecast Builder um, email address at NOAA.gov that will uh, um, get to us and, and provide a, a means for a communication as well about how uh, any, any trouble you might run into, any suggestions you have for improvement. And uh, we've already actually got a couple come in uh, just during this presentation. So we'll be addressing those. And um, that's the, the one goal is we we want to be extremely responsive to uh, the feedback we get from, from you all. This, this is your project as much as it's ours. This is a, a way of making sure that the forecasters have what they need to create a, a, a high quality, consistent and seamless forecast. So anything that you come up with that might uh, help have an idea that could help us out, just pass it on and we'll see what we can do with it because we're, we, we're all trying to do the same thing. You're all trying to, to, to keep uh, highly relevant and, and uh, be very uh, uh, integral part of the, the forecast process. Well, thank you, Chuck and uh, Andy, uh, for all your hard work with uh, this team and uh, the presentation today. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, John.